those. All right, so I'm gonna follow John. I'll give a slightly different uh, view, but uh, we, we obviously are doing very similar things. To me, the fundamental importance of quantum computing is getting uh, quantum circuits and getting them on hardware as well as software. So I'll give you a bit of a feel for what we're doing in this way. First, I just wanted to go back and uh, this will be one of the limited uh, shameless advertisement uh, uh, slides of mine. But in 2016, I, I think many of you know, we decided to put one of these uh, quantum computers on the cloud. And to me, what I find very rewarding is seeing that today there's over 500 papers using our machine. And if you count out how many quantum circuits are run on our systems, we're uh, are now uh, exceeding 2 billion quantum circuits a day. This really shows that there's a lot of work and a lot of people uh, using these systems. So for me, um, I don't, I like to think of uh, this as a system now rather than a lab demonstration. And when you start thinking of it as a system, it's a different mindset to making progress. This is not saying that it's an engineering problem. It's just saying, how do you put all these together? How do you make sure you uh, roll out a lot, uh, roadmap? And how do you make sure research injects into this in the right uh, time? So um, we have, I think today, over 20 systems online, ranging from 20, a uh, few qubits, five qubits to 27 qubits uh, to 65 qubits and various different simulators. And we have a philosophy for our own internal group that the same systems that we provide as tools, we also do our experiments on. Uh, this philosophy is fundamental for our progress because it, it allows us to stay and really make sure we always take the system mindset, put the best on there, and then we try to do our demonstrations and our own research on that. And so various different demonstrations. Here's one of our Falcons where you can see the error rates are about 99 uh, below 99 for a two qubit readout, all, all, all of them in the high, um, high, high, high times. And as John said, coherence times are in the around the 100 microseconds and things like this. Okay. And just to last time before I get into the details, I think last year at the APX, it was uh, APS, which is a large, meet, a large meeting, it was rewarding to see 46 papers using our systems. And one of the work that I really like to see is some of the community is also showing how to benchmark these systems. And this work shows uh, looking at entanglement larger and larger. Now I'm going to take a transition. So we're on this path towards um, building up larger and larger systems. Last year, um, we outlined our roadmap. And today, as I said, we have a 27 and 65 qubits. And we have a path towards 1,000 qubits. And I'll give you a little bit of a um, idea of what is what we needed to solve to enable and give ourselves confidence in this. So the Falcon, obviously, there's qubits in the middle. Um, and to do this, you needed to get the flip chip technology. Um, that's important to be able to make uh, sure you can drive from, from a different plane. Second to this is uh, we need to develop a technique that would allow us to position the qubits at uh, frequency so we would have more control. Um, Typically, the frequency of trans, uh, transmon qubits is given um, by the junction physics. And the junction physics, uh, the, the junction energy depends exponentially on, 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 on things like the thickness of the barrier. And so it's very hard to get them at the exact uh, frequency. So the team developed a method where they would uh, shoot these uh, qubits with the laser afterwards and be able to tune them to different frequencies. And what you see here is about a tenfold increase in the um, reliability of predicting where the qubits uh, would be. And th this was the key enabler to get the yield up because without this, the device just hadn't, it was just not useful. It, there were too many collisions and uh, it was uh, not able to do it. To get to the 65, uh, this is well known in the field, but multiplexing and making sure you have individual readout of all the chips and limiting the amount of uh, amplifiers uh, is key to get uh, these larger systems. You don't want the whole fridge taken up uh, with the amplifiers. So we've worked on various different multiplexing ratios. The one that we uh, use for the 65 qubits is an eight to one. Probably we, uh, we've gone a bit further, but you probably wouldn't get much more than double this in the multiplexing for the uh, uh, bandwidth that is given by the quantum limited amplifiers. To go to the Eagle, uh, which we're working on at the moment, and I'll give you a bit of a feel, you start to have a perimeter problem. If you imagine now you've got to get all these wires into the center, now you've actually got to get multi-level wiring 
uh, to allow you to get all the controls into all the qubits in the middle. And so this uh, uh, result, this needs to develop through silicon vias and different types of technology, technology to really get the interposer, so the flip chip, to have enough configurability to get the controls where you need. And I'll, I'll have a slide on that after this. And then going to the Osprey, which is our 433. And for those wondering why these are random numbers, uh, this is very similar to what uh, uh, John Martinez uh, said. We, we design our qubits with error correction in mind, and these are different types of code uh, sizes that can be investigated. And so Osprey, it really comes down to the wires in the fridge, getting the Quiaflex uh, cables and all this type of technology. Uh, and that combined with the packaging puts us on a pretty, well, uh, pretty comfortable path towards getting to a thousand qubits. So here's a zoom in of some of the um, uh, real, real cross section of one of the uh, multi-level wiring. And you can see basically the different three different levels of uh, the wires, they come in, the different uh, modes allow you to come in through silicon via to get to the other ones. And you can basically imagine that you can get anywhere on the chip. Experimentally, we've seen that this makes a uh, negligible difference on the coherence if done properly. And, uh, and we're well on our path to re releasing the 127 qubit with this technology this year. And so this really shows a path of basically getting up to uh, getting up to a full wafer of qubits and giving and allowing to get the controls into where it needs to get. Going to a thousand qubits and making sure um, most importantly, we're pushing the error rates down um, it, it is the, the challenge and we need different types of gates. Um, we've been investigating, uh, we, we have this philosophy of doing research and then injecting into our systems. We're working on injecting actually both of these into our Falcon systems, but these are two different types of gates. Um, the fast high fidelity ZZ gate is very similar to the gate that uh, John Martinez uh, described and direct uh, ZZ canceling cross resonance allows the gate to be much faster uh, for, for the typical gate that we use in our technology. And both of these get about a factor of five, um, getting close to three nines fidelity uh, for the two qubit gates. And that's still another order of magnitude get to, to get to our desire of getting four nines, but you can see that we're uh, well on the path uh, of integrating this, uh, uh, well on the path to this, and, and our plan is to integrate this into our larger systems. Going beyond this, um, this is where we have to show that we do lots of things in parallel. The price per qubit, even though we're on our third generation of the electronics, it's just going to get too, too, too ridiculous, and uh, we need things like cryo CMOS. Um, we also need, um, you, uh, there was a question asked about the size of the system. So how do we make smaller uh, um, qubits? We have this work that shows that you can get all of the capacitance through the junction. We call this a uh, uh, mixed element transmon. And it, it has still a uh, higher frequency and there'll be a longer talk to go into it. Um, we've made this publicly of trying to make a super fridge that can hold many more qubits. Um, making quantum motherboards, I like to say, refer to of how we uh, reduce circulators and amplifiers to give the things. And um, one of the ones that I'm most passionate about, and I think as a field, we need to do so much more research as quantum interconnects. How are we going to connect chip to chip or fridge to fridge? Some of the early work that is not um, obviously coupling to qubits, we've already started this, and we're looking at how to make really high uh, CD germanium uh, optical resonators. If we can get these really high, we can uh, imagine now that we can couple by the refractive index, uh, uh, changing the basically the amount of the, the qubit C. So if the qubit's in a different microwave state, we can get a different uh, ca a cavity uh, length, and we could get a coupling between the qubits and the cavity. And, this is one way that we hope that we can uh, go towards interconnects. There are many other ones that I'm not going to talk about today, but I think as a general, we need to do a lot more work on solving the quantum interconnect problem for getting larger and larger chips. So my thoughts on quantum processes to sum up, um, you have to investigate all these problems in parallel. This is uh, a very challenging thing. Coherence, material science, honestly, continues to be the limiting factor for most of the work. Junction physics uh, is also limiting for the yield, getting that junction, solving the exponential in the uh, energy, Joseph's and energy to get the qubits where you want. And ultimately, as I said, interconnects and modularity to get further. So now I'm gonna take a transition to software. So traditionally the quantum circuit model, uh, I'm sure all of you have heard that you represent any quantum program as a circuit. Um, and these circuits uh, fall into the class if, they, if, they, if the quantum program can be written this way is B cubed 
uh, BQP. Um, the quantum circuit model, I love it, but I think it is also limiting. And one of the examples of that is uh, dynamic circuits. So there's so much exciting work. I would say the most, one of the most well-known is teleportation, the act of swapping two states over a distance. If you can add feed forward to it, can uh, simplify this process. But also, uh, you can even go way be beyond this, and you go back to early days of quantum uh, information and any Clifford. Uh, so that could be a swap network, uh, can be uh, simplified by giving you the ability to do simple checks and feed forward, ultimately error correction and things like this needs this. So getting this uh, concept of dynamical circuits and how you integrate this into your systems allows you this uh, extra dimension of uh, seeing how you can extend quantum circuits to use classical computing uh, to do much more. And as a simple example, even though I'm not recommending everyone go do this, if you take the bernstein berzerati algorithm, you could imagine trying to do this algorithm, which is a bunch of C-naughts where you prepare all the, uh, insula bit, uh, the auxiliary bits, and then you map it to the state, and then you measure it with the ability to reset. You obviously can map it down to two qubits, and then you can see that this uh, works uh, much, much better. Obviously, this is kind of a joke, but it points out the um, power of giving yourself to uh, reset, feed forward, and reuse qubits uh, can make things much, much simpler. And uh, I think that's um, exciting going forward. Also beyond this, um, phase estimation. I'm sure many of you know this is fundamental for, any al for many algorithms. Uh, you probably all know the quantum Fourier transform version, uh, but there are two versions that I think uh, I like better that are generally underrepresented. Uh, the first one is the Kataev version. And this one, uh, basically you have a single extra qubit and you use it to measure the different, uh, the cosine or the sign and the sign properties for every uh, bit of information of the, the unitary you're interested. And then by classical post-processing all of these results together, you can infer the actual phase of the operator you want. So this sort of shows that you're actually mixing a bit more classical and now you're doing the classical in some way where you're doing that computation on uh, independently run circuits. And then you come back to, then there's another example, uh, which is uh, the iterative phase estimation, where now you do that for loop rather than over different uh, runs, and you do it by uh, running each one of these circuits and feed forwarding the result. And so this sees, shows that you've got this trade space between how you do classical calculations that can give you a better way and give you a way, sorry, can give you a different way of investigating when one circuit works better than the other. And in this uh, simple paper, we showed for small, uh, small systems, uh, sorry, for small bits of information, the Kataev works a little bit better. And this is simple because simply understood it gives, uh, it gives you, um, um, it gives you a faster way of getting that information, but uh, sorry, the iterative, but for longer times, the decoherence starts to play in and then you lose this, uh, this small speed up. But both of them, uh, both are, are exponentially improvements over the classical algorithm for, for this and, and both promising to investigate. But my point here was just to highlight this, this sort of classical coming in two different ways. So if you start to think about this, any real workload for quantum computing is gonna be this combination of classical and quantum. And a quantum computer to me, isn't just a quantum system. It's a hybrid uh, server that has both classical control electronics, all the cryogenic uh, inputs, the quantum processor and all coming together. But this uh, view is a little bit too naive. And so what we've been doing and thinking about is how do you extend this? And to me, there's two fundamental times that emerge. There's the real time and the near time. The real time gives you an estimate of the classical computations that you want to do within the coherence time of your qubit to enable the dynamic circuits. These need to be done in nanoseconds and these need to be driven by the community and the research of which ones we need to put into the electronics to enable us to explore more. And then near time, you want to basically focus on doing as much you want to get the limit of the quantum processor and you want to do the computations as close as possible uh, to, the, to the quantum computer to allow you to do the, the example I gave before, like Katev. And so this combination of both of these sets up this nice view of what a quantum computer will be. And our view on this um, has been uh, progressing in different ways. We just recently working with the community and uh, uh, a few colleagues uh, at Amazon updated OpenCASM 3 to completely support these dynamic circuits, plus as well add timing and different types of information. So you can imagine exploring more of these circuits at a low level. 
And today um, we're releasing our first version of the Kiskit runtime, which is this, a secure containerized container where you get, um, where you can imagine how you, we, we leverage, uh, for, the, for physicists, they don't know so much of this, but we leverage can, container technology to give you classical resources, which you can partition very close to your CPU to design those programs. And as an example, uh, one of our recent uh, papers in 2019, it would take you basically uh, 120 times longer to run it uh, than uh, with this containerized technique. So I'm very happy this is going out. I think it's gonna be a big uh, change for the people that are using these systems and I'm looking forward to seeing what people can do with it. Okay, so quantum software, I think the interplay between classical and quantum, I think is, underestimated and there's a lot to be done. In a longer talk, I would talk about many of the applications that we're exploring that trades actually classical and quantum resources to allow us to look at uh, larger molecules. And recently the team did an example of water and capacity of the quantum circuits is fundamental for how we go forward. How much of these can you run per second to really allow you to do these more complicated workloads and, and using containerized technology uh, is the only way forward for that. Okay, change of topic. So the third is we wanted to, I believe there's a path. Obviously, I want to get to quantum uh, error correction. And uh, as the team, we've always thought of quantum circuits and the quality of them as a transition as we get more and more improved ways of understanding what goes on. And so we, we asked ourselves, can you come up with ways where you could do something um, simple, like add different results together to give improved results. And the we call this quantum, sorry, error mitigation. And we used it to show a chemistry result uh, improved a few years ago. But now we ask a different question. Can we start to uh, and take error mitigation and error correction together? And is there a path forward? To me, this is not at all researched and very exciting. And I don't think this paper, which I'll give you is the final answer, but it's opening a different uh, avenue that I think is worth exploring. And so we asked the question, well, in quantum error correcting codes, there are many gates that are um, basically efficient and there are other gates that are not. So Clifford gates for most codes are pretty efficient to do, but T gates um, became very expensive. And for those that know about magic states distillation, this is what actually uses most of the actual resources and the ridiculous high numbers of qubits that people uh, uh, mention about what is possible for quantum computing. So we asked the question, can you error mitigate the magic states whilst uh, error correcting the Clifford states? And what can this actually give you a direction and formalize a a separation between the two. And putting this all together, we came to the conclusion that yes, there is, but it's not the exponential. You get a separation between the two. And uh, what's exciting by me is there's a feasibility range of 10 to the three to 10 to the four T gates, where this is beyond what we believe we can simulate, but uh, not all the full way to um, uh, quantum error correction. So on that, I think I just wanna close by saying, um, I think there's a lot to be explored. I think there's a continuum between all, but what matters the most is the quantum circuits, how you implement them, how good a quality they are, how fast you run them, and what quantum circuits you can run. And I'd happily take any questions and answer, give my thoughts on applications if people are interested. All right, thank you very much, Jay. So um, let's see a couple of questions uh, in the chat. So um, if I can process them a little bit. So, so people are asking, interested to know whether you're, you know, uh, on, on track for the, you know, for the mark of uh, about a thousand qubits by 2023. Uh, I don't know if that's information you're uh, willing to share. Um, we're, we're on track for it, for it. I don't see anything that's stop. Well, there are some challenges, uh, the 127. Um, we're on track for the end uh, for October, November time of this year of what we plan. Um, we wouldn't have released our roadmap with as much detail as we did if we hadn't been implementing internally for a few years. I'm confident about that. What I am not confident about is how we solve the problem of modularity going forward and how we think of different codes that can actually connect these two chips and how we can... Um, uh, I think there's great work of uh, chip to chip uh, work of David Schuster, where he's trying to uh, like uh, join two different types of chips together with different type of coupling. 
I think our work on transduction is one, but I think the whole field of getting in quantum interconnect with high fidelity in quantum channels that are not ridiculously slow is a very exciting area. So you think that that's gonna be the bottleneck in, in the near future? I think that is going to be a difficult challenge to solve. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, so another question that appears here um, um, is about you know, limitation, what's limiting you know, current uh, quality. So one, one question that was raised whether, uh, you know, whether the you know, pulse, you know, pulses or you're, not, you're able to you know, um, apply or are giving you some limitation at all or? So generally it's coherence, um, but that's a cop-out answer because you slow everything down until you're limited by coherence. Right. But as you push the limit forward, um, getting your um, getting your gates to work in the presence of uh, unwanted terms can be some of the difficult challenge. Um, however, there are composite pulse techniques which we, we we've used that can get rid of it. Um, but generally, you find it's a, it's a way up of coherence and then pushing your understanding the Hamiltonian to that level. Um, I would say some of the control electronics and noises on that. Um, as we push to 10 to the negative four error rates um, become extremely concerning. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, another question kind of concerns with the, uh, you know, it seems like you're moving towards uh, tunable couplers. Um, does that somehow mean that you're, uh, you know, moving away from the cross resonance gate? No. Um, so this one is not tunable. This one is tunable. They both have their pros and cons. This one is a cross resonant gate with a fixed uh, coupling that has a resonant filter that reduces the ZZ effect and allows you to have the gate to operate and it gives us high fidelity. This one is simpler to adding a coupler. Um, both, are, both are options and possibilities. Um, they have their pros and cons, but we, are, we continue to explore different types of gates, but we always ask the question of how can we inject them in, into our architectures to build larger devices. I see. Um, another question concerns with, uh, you, know, you mentioned uh, uh, optical uh, interconnects and optical, we need optical microwave uh, conversion. Um, so uh, are you currently uh, you know, performing experiments in that direction or? Yes, this is real data. This is real data of 150 million Q with a silicon geranium, uh, silicon optical resonator by our team. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's kind of, you know, what's your prospects? I mean, on this kind of technology, I mean. Uh, well, this know. is why I already said, I think quantum interconnects are very exciting. I think they're extremely challenging. Um, I think this is one way of doing it and I'm excited for the team to do it. But you need uh, really, really high cues as first step, the team has done that. Then you need strong microwave to optical coupling. Uh, that's the next challenge. And then ultimately you have to connect these, uh, these different uh, uh, quantum processes together. All of these, I would not under, underestimate the amount of physics that needs to be solved. Uh, mm -hmm. for each one of those tests. So I'd say I'm very excited to see the really high cues that we're getting for these type of resonators. Um, but I think there's, there's a lot more that needs to be done uh, to, to, to make this, uh, to make it as simple as connecting to uh, quantum, uh, quantum processing units. Mm -hmm. Also, when, when you mentioned, you know, the, you know, the, use of error mitigation and, and fault tolerance. So you estimated some window of number of T gates that, so that that's somehow estimated under what assumptions? I mean, so, so I direct you to following the paper and it's hard to do it in a, uh, in a, in a short amount of time. But essentially the idea is um, you, take your, um, you take your code and we come up with a technique where you can um, uh, by randomizing the different ways of doing it, you can reliably get a single parameter epsilon that represents uh, the mitigated correction factor that needs to be applied uh, for the T gate. Then once you got that mitigated correction factor, 
you apply it and you ask, am I, um, am I now still getting a reliable, um, a reliable signal? And so now error mitigation is not error correction because you don't extend the actual quantum state. You make the observable you measure get more and more accurate by classically post-processing the results together to give you a better estimate. And so now you've got to think of this circuit as I prepare some state, I apply my circuit that has some Clifford's and T's and I measure some observable. And now I'm going to do multiple different uh, resamplings and putting the noise in different ways by something that I can reliably detect to give me a higher quality observable. And it showed, and what we, we showed in this paper is there it is formally able to predict how this will scale and you put in some numbers and you see uh, those numbers have a, a separation to Sergey and David Gossett's PRL that showed how to calculate a classically a simulate uh, quantum circuits in terms of T gates and put the complexity in the T gates and you can get a different exponential um, coefficient and for re realistic uh, um, error rates um, you can you can get to a point where they, th these coefficients um, give you a separation. I think long term, I would like to see more of this. I'd like to see how much of classical processing mixed with um, fault tolerance. Ultimately, ultimately, the answer is we need quantum error correction and full fault tolerance. But at the end, what you care about is a computation and does my computation get implemented with high enough quality? And can I be confident that it did that? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jay.